to Santa Barbara Navy League TV. Color Guard, parade the colors. I'd like to leave you all in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible. Color Guard, retire the colors. At this time, I'd like to ask Jeff Cotter to please deliver our invocation. Shall we pray? God, we realize that because of these men here today, that there is truly a divine power to see it through, whatever it may be. We acknowledge that our lives are truly better because of these lives. What they gave, we may never know, but you do. And we thank you that they are a reminder to us of eternal values, that they give meaning to words like promise, vows, commitment, relationship, service, and true heroism. We thank you for them. We ask you to bless them immensely today and forever. Amen. As I'm speaking, volunteers are handing out gifts from the Santa Barbara Navy League to our prisoners, former prisoners of war, and our Red River Rats. Please accept them with our greatest gratitude. The Santa Barbara Navy League is a nonpartisan, civilian, nonprofit organization. We're the largest of 250 plus councils around the world without a deep water port. We have more than 1,100 members and a board of 21 professionals. We're not part of the Navy. We're not part of the federal government. We don't receive funding of any type. Our goals are to provide support to the service members of the United States Armed Forces, support the families, youth programs, educate the public and our business leaders and our elected officials. On the back side of your program, is a list of our currently adopted units and organizations. And you will see they come from the United States Navy, United States Marine Corps, Coast Guard, United States Air Force, and the United States Army. At this time, it is my great honor to introduce a gentleman who is a fellow prisoner of war with Admiral Stockdale, my friend and fellow American, Captain Charlie Plum. Charlie. Thank you. My, uh, my fellow ex-prisoners of war, good to be with you again. I'm always honored to be in your presence. Honored guests and friends, crew of the brand new ship Stockdale, we've had a great morning in putting this ship into the fleet. And probably no time in history do we need it more with pirates and terrorists and rogue nations, nuclear weapons. We need her firepower. She's certainly the sexiest, most technologically ship uh, I've, uh, I've seen. And I'm proud to, uh, to have her in the fleet. But Perhaps in a larger sense, while we commission this 9,200 tons of formidable force, we also breathe life into the legacy that she represents, our legacy, the legacy of the prisoners of war, and the legacy of two great Americans who served this country while we were over there in jail. Of course, James Bond Stockdale, our leader, who set up the secret communication system and established the uh, levels of resistance that gave us all hope when hope was gone. He lived his motto, unity over self. 
And at the same time, here in the States, his devoted wife, Sybil, fought the good fight as well. She rallied our wives and she mobilized millions with the little bracelets with our names on them. She went worldwide to try to keep our enemy to their commitment and she exposed single-handedly this woman, exposed the brutality that we were receiving from our, from our captors. And so those two heroes who now uh, share the name of our brand new destroyer exhibited the courage, the commitment, the integrity to which we all aspire. And you say, well, that was then, this is now. Our country doesn't have those heroes anymore. And I am here as an eyewitness to tell you that we do. I wish you and I, you could, I wish you could have been with Susan, my wife, and Alex, our son, aboard the Stockdale as we sailed with her Monday and Tuesday from San Diego. Because at every turn, we saw the crew and officers of this great ship exhibit the same philosophy of courage, of commitment, and of integrity that we, the prisoners of war, learned from her namesake, Jim Stockdale. And it seemed that every time we turned around, we saw his spirit aboard that ship, the same spirit that we saw with him in the camp. And so, as Stockdale is commissioned to protect our liberty, she also projects our legacy the legacy of the prisoners of war, the legacy of the Stockdale family. And as she sails into every port in the world and on every sea on the globe, she will, in fact, uphold our motto, the prisoners of war. She will, as we did, return with honor. And so as she sails into the fleet, the world and our enemies should know that there still is in America the commitment, the courage, the integrity, and alive and well are the likes of Jim and Sybil Stockdale. Thank you very much. The next hero I want to introduce stood by us and worked with Sybil tirelessly, put a lot of uh, his time and a lot of his money into an effort to better the conditions of the prisoners of war. While we were in jail, he was flying jets around with medical supplies and gifts and letters to us, trying to get them into Hanoi. And afterwards, he joined our group as an honorary member uh, of, of our group and attends our conventions and supports us in every way. You know him better than I. May I introduce friend of the prisoner of war, Ross Perot. Oh, thank you very much. You probably heard about all you want to hear from me today. We got a big wave from several. She got it. She got it. Now I'm going to tell you a couple of stories you've probably never heard of. One day I'm sitting at home. The war has been over for many years now. I get a call, unsolicited, from a man named Ulysses Presley, and I thought Elvis might have been reborn. <laughs> Said he was a Special Forces Sergeant, served in the Vietnam War, fought alongside the Nung Vietnamese, wouldn't be alive without the Nung Vietnamese, and that 125 Nung Vietnamese that had really done heroic things with us had to flee from Vietnam at the end of the war and were living in an island named, it was either Star Island or High Island off Hong Kong. As Hong Kong was being taken over by China, they had made a deal to ship these people back to be executed. And he said, Pro, I wouldn't be alive without these men. We've got to get them back. Well, I was really hung up on Ulysses and Elvis and that sort of thing. But anyhow, I did call. Now, this tells you all about our military. I called General Hugh Shelton. You said, what was he doing then? He was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
But if there was ever a man that cared about his troops, it's General Shelton. And this was Special Forces Sergeant that was giving me the story. I called him. I said, General, did you ever hear of a Special Forces Sergeant named Ulysses Presley? I got a 10-minute lecture about all the great things he'd done. Not bad, is it? When a four-star general knows what a sergeant did years ago. And then I explained to him why he'd call me, and his exact words were, Perot, I wouldn't be alive without them. We've got to get those men out of there. So then, the next thing we did was talk, to, this is always the toughest part of the equation, State Department, and say, would you let them come in? And finally, they said, if you can prove that they are who they say they are, and of course, it didn't hurt at all that General Shelton thought they should get in. So I looked around, and I finally just impulsively called General Wayne Downing, who had just retired as head of Homeland Security, to get his advice. I told him who they were. I'll never forget his words. I wouldn't be alive without them, Perot. We've got to get them out. I said, well, General, I need somebody. Can you tell me somebody who could identify them? Because that's all the State Department wants. He says, Pro, I'll be on the next plane. Four-star general going back in. Not sending anybody else. He was going. I said, all right, where do I send your tickets? He says, Pro, nobody buys this ticket from me. I wouldn't be alive without them. I said, can I help you with anything? And this is really why I'm telling you this story. He says, yeah, I need somebody that can be a translator. I can't speak their language. Now, impulsively, guess who I called? Nguyen Kwok Dot. Max. See, when Max came home, was at the end of the war, and you guys will never forget this, there were two former POWs. I apologize. Are one of them here today that called me? They were on the border going in to pick up Max. And I said, wait a minute, guys. You'd be a bigger target than Max. Give me one hour with you. They said, you have one hour, Pro, and then we're going. I impulsively picked up the phone and called the White House because I knew General Brent Scowcroft was there, but I'm the luckiest guy in the world. He answered the phone. I, you know, I was there when I, he's the gun that I, I explained it to him, and he says, um, Bro, we've got to get those men out. I know exactly who they are. And I said, Okay, so it's, it's and you'll support us on this. He said, I'm going to have the embassy, I'm going to have everything spring loaded. And, um, but uh, we need an interpreter to figure out if these are really the men that say they are. So I see Max Dodd had worked for me. He was now retired. He was living in California. I called Max, and of course, you know his response. He agreed to go. Now, you know what Max went through, and you can understand why Max wouldn't want to go. But Max went and identified the people. They're all back in the USA, guess where they are? Living in right around Fort Bragg, but not on the base. Not a single one is on welfare. They all have good jobs, but the special forces look at them, looked after them like they were a personal member of their family, which they are under military terms. And doesn't that say a lot about the military? A couple of days later, he called me back and says, they're on the way home. We'll be on the next plane. Now, he had Max Dodd with him as an interpreter. He had Harry McKillop with him, who worked for me for years, all the way back through the time you were there. So he really had the Delta team there with him. And Harry, of course, arranged all the airplanes and everything. Then, when Wayne got back, I said, now, Wayne, would you tell me how you got on the island? I was talking over the phone to him. Classic is what you'd expect. He says, don't ask Perot and slam the phone down. And I, none of them, including, you'd think Max would break and tell, no, but Wayne had a deal with him, nobody. So, and, but it's just a, incredible. Here we have a four-star general going back in to pick, get, make sure that this happens. But I just can't get over how everybody is still as focused as you always have been to try to make sure we never leave a person behind. So I could go on and bore, I wouldn't bore this crowd, but I'd, typically I would bore a crowd if I went on and told too many. But I think that gives you a sense of my feeling that the spirit is alive and well and even better than ever. And you can't believe how many calls I got right after those Navy SEALs did their job. Wow. 
they want to make sure that these men are properly recognized and honored. And I, I'm, you know, I made a few calls, but I was late making. You know, everybody was all geared up for that, which I would have expected. But I just wish, in the private sector of our society, the chairman of the board of big companies cared as much about a third shift factory worker as all of you care about one another, regardless of what the rank is, because. You're a band of brothers, and you live the motto of the Three Musketeers, one for all and all for one. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, would that make us a great country if we all had your spirit. But nobody deserves more credit for the improvements that were made than Sybil Stockdale because she was our strong, mag she, I steal magnolia. That's a good way we could say it. And uh, absolutely were there every step of the way and would go anywhere, anytime. She had children. She, you know, you could understand if she couldn't leave home. But whatever it took to make sure that these men were protected and they stopped the brutal treatment, and it was just months after, and we never sometimes could deliver the Christmas gifts and all that, but the Vietnamese got tired of the bad publicity all over the world. They were getting hammered, hammered, thanks to Sybil. And that made a significant change. So, Sybil, you're one of a kind. You'll always be in our hearts. And your family is certainly in our hearts because they had to be there with you without your husband there all through that difficult period. And they had to be semi on their own as you were out saving these men. So, we thank you. And we really, 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 really appreciate all of your great work over the years. And there's just one like you. Thank you very much. I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is Old Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over great institutions of learning. I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, honor, truth, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident. I am arrogant. I am proud. When I am flown with my fellow banners, my head is held a little higher. My colors are a little truer. I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshiped. I am saluted. I am respected. I am revered. I am loved and I am feared. For more than 200 years, I have fought in every battle of every war. Gettysburg, Shiloh, Appomattox, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Argonne Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, the jungles of Guam, Okinawa, Tarawa, Korea, Vietnam, and in the heat of the Persian Gulf and a score of other places. Long forgotten by all but those who were there with me. I was there. I led my sailors and marines. I followed them. I watched over them. They loved me. I was on a small hill on Iwo Jima. I was dirty, battle-torn, and tired, but my sailors and marines cheered me. I was proud. I have been soiled, burned, torn and trampled on the streets of countries that have helped set free. It does not hurt, for I am invincible. I have been soiled, burned, torn and trampled on the streets of my own country. And when it is done by those whom with I have served in battle, it hurts. But I shall overcome, for I am strong. I have slipped the surly bounds of earth, and from my vantage point on the moon, I stand watch over the new frontiers of space. I have been the silent witness to all of America's finest hours. I have flown 
over the top of the World Trade Centers and after September 11th, 2001, have flown over its rubble to remind the evil in our world that my spirit will not be crushed. The American people will not be broken. But my finest hour comes when I am torn into strips to be used as bandages for my wounded comrades on the field of battle. When I fly half-mast to honor my sailors and Marines, and when I lie in the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the graveside of her fallen son or daughter, I am proud. My name is Old Glory. Long may I wave. Dear God, long may I wave. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Karen Crawford, president of the Santa Barbara Na of Navy League. If you can be seated. On behalf of the Navy League of the United States Santa Barbara Council, I would like to thank the Secretary of the Navy, Naval Base Ventura County, the USS Stockdale, and their command. It has been an honor and a pleasure to co-host this commissioning with Naval Base Ventura County. The flag, which was draped on Admiral Stockdale's casket, flew today aboard the USS Stockdale for the commissioning. It was then lowered and brought here for today's Old Glory ceremony, which was performed by six officers representing the six ranks in the progression of Admiral Stockdale's career. The flag was then presented to Mrs. Stockdale, another American hero. Santa Barbara Navy League takes seriously our mission to educate the public, business leaders, and elected officials of the needs of our men and women serving our country. Today's commissioning has provided us this opportunity for the public across the nation to view naval history as it occurred and to recognize and appreciate the POWs and veterans of the Vietnam era. A few years ago, I had the privilege to hear a former Commandant of the Marine Corps, General P.X. Kelly, as he spoke at the Pierre Clayson's Military Ball. He said something that I had never heard before. He said that the veterans of Vietnam had stopped the expansion of communism and that they should be proud. Their service to our country was the first step in the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. Today, we are here to tell you, you should be proud. You deserve to be proud. You returned with honor. Gentlemen, you did succeed. You did succeed. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. May God bless you as God blesses our country. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you to add, I'd like to ask you to remain in your seats while our POWs and our Red River rats exit the premises through this door to their waiting airplane. Thank you all for coming, and God bless America. Good afternoon, I'm Doug Crawford, Vice President of the Santa Barbara Navy League and on the Board of Directors, National Navy League of the United States. It's an honor to be here at Bard Mansion today with Brick Connors, former commanding officer of this base. Brick, it's a vision that takes an opportunity to be able to have an event like this. It takes hard work that follows vision and great leadership. 
and a great command. And I would like to thank you for the uh, work that you began last fall to make sure that this uh, commissioning of the USS Stockdale and the POW reception that was going to take place here actually came to fruition. So I'd like to thank you and ask you what this means to you now that uh, you've retired as commanding officer of the fifth largest naval base in the United States, eighth largest naval base in the world, to now as a civilian come back here and to be able to see the people execute as uh, you had hoped they would before. Well, this commission was certainly one of the uh, huge highlights of, of my career for a couple of reasons. One of them is uh, a commissioning of a ship at any base is one of the most prestigious events that can happen. And uh, to get um, my hero from the second month I was at the Naval Academy and I heard him speak, who kind of changed my whole outlook on my approach to life and my service in the Navy, was, the, uh, was one of the highest honors as well. So uh, to, to partner with the Santa Barbara Navy League and uh, create the, uh, the, the, and demonstrate our capability to host such an event of this size, this uh, prestige, and uh, the, the solemnity and reverence that uh, it needs to be for, for the kind of guy Stockdale was, um, I couldn't have thought of any better partnership. Well, again, we thank you. This has been uh, four hours of some of the greatest history that our country could pay to the men and women who served during the Vietnam era. And we want everyone in our country to know that the light of the flame still burns for those veterans who served our country with honor and then returned with honor. And to all of them, we say thank you and God bless you as God blesses this nation. Thank you. With the help of individual and corporate members, the sea services become integrated into the local communities they serve and protect. In addition to providing support today to the men and women serving at home and abroad, the Navy League always looks to the future, to today's young people and tomorrow's leaders. Scholarship programs provide financial assistance to the dependents and direct descendants of sea service personnel. And Navy League supported youth programs such as the Naval Sea Cadet Corps and Navy and Marine Corps Junior ROTC give thousands of young people the opportunity to develop leadership skills, test their limits, and perhaps prepare for a career in one of the sea services. The need for a strong, vital sea service, recognized by Theodore Roosevelt in 1902, is no less today. The challenges facing our nation have never been greater. More than 100 years later, the Navy League continues to answer the call. Your support makes a difference to our men and women of the sea services who serve today and will serve tomorrow in support of American sea power. As one Secretary of the Navy said, the sun never sets on the Navy League.